In this video, we will discuss forward rate agreements and yield curve theories. There are three primary yield curve theories, the liquidity preference theory, the expectations theory, and the segmentation theory. Under liquidity preference, investors would prefer to lock up their money for as short a time as possible. They would always like to be able to go to the bank and get their cash back, and therefore they are only willing to lock up their money for a longer time period if they get a higher interest rate for it. So under liquidity preference, you would always have an upward sloping yield curve, as we see here in 2000 and 1999. Under the expectations theory, investors invest based on what they expect future inflation and interest rates to be, so an upward sloping yield curve would generally indicate that investors believe inflation is going up. And as we see here in 1980, this downward sloping yield curve, which is relatively rare, is when investors believe inflation is going down. The final theory, segmentation theory, is based on the idea that each of the different maturities trade in a different basket and their yield is actually independent of the other due to the desires of investors that want to invest in that basket. This would explain phenomena like we see right here, where in August of 1999, you generally had an upward sloping yield curve consistent with liquidity preference theory, but at the very end, the 20-year to the 30-year maturity, it went back down. And this is commonly explained by organizations like insurance companies and pension plans, which have very long-term liabilities, wanting to match the long-term liabilities with the long-term assets and creating a demand for 30-year bonds. Most of the time, we see an upward sloping yield curve consistent with liquidity preference. There are a few occasions, like when Paul Volcker took over the Fed and in 1980 drastically increased short-term interest rates to cut down on inflation, People actually believed that inflation would go down, and due to that expectation, you saw this downward sloping yield curve. If expectations theory is correct, then we can use the equation that we're going to get the same future value regardless of what time period we invest to figure out what the future interest rates would be. So under pure expectations theory, if we invest a certain dollar amount present value today and lock it in for a two-year time period, we would get this two-year interest rate, and the future value would be PV1 plus R2 squared. And that would give you the same interest rate as if we would take your money, lock it in for one year today, get it back in one year, and lock it back into the same investment for another year. So a total of two years in each case. This time it's locked up for two years initially. This time it's locked up for one year, like a one-year CD, followed by getting your money back and investing in another one-year CD one year from now. So if pure expectations theory is correct, we could rearrange this equation, knock the PV off both sides, and solve for this term by taking 1 plus R2 squared divided by 1 plus R1, then subtract one from each side, and we get R1, the one-year interest rate in year two, or one year from now, is going to be 1 plus R2 squared divided by 1 plus R1 minus 1. If we use this, and in particular, we apply it to the yield curve in 1980, we would get G6 right here for our two-year rate, and G5 right here for our one-year rate, and we would take 1 plus this squared divided by 1 plus this minus 1, and we would get 12.8%. So right now, or at least at the beginning of March of 1980, the one-year interest rate was 15.1%, and pure expectations theory implies that inflation is going to drop and interest rates are going to drop, and one year from now, this rate is going to drop to 12.8% or otherwise this yield curve is going to come down. So that would be consistent with expectations theory. One of the places it can be applied in futures is if we were to sign a future on interest rate to lock up the interest rate for one year loan one year from now, it would have to be this, otherwise there would be an arbitrage opportunity.
Our first equation was derived just for two years and we used quantized compounding. We will now derive a more general equation for any number of years, our time periods, using continuous compounding. We will again say the future value equals the present value exponent of now R2T2, where T2 is any long time period, and that has to be the same thing as the present value exponent of R1T1, where this is a shorter time period than T2, then times exponent RK T2 minus T1, where T2 minus T1 is whatever time period is not included in the first time period T1. So the total time period is the same. This is for a shorter time period than this is, and this is for the remaining difference. For exponents, then we would say R2 times T2 has to equal RK times T2 minus T1 plus R1 times T1. We rearrange this, take this to the left side, this to the right side, and now we want to solve for RK, so we subtract R1 T1 from both sides, and then we divide by T2 minus T1, and we get RK equals T2 times R2 plus R1 times T1 divided by T2 minus T1. We could apply this, for example, to the yield curve in August 1999, this upward sloping yield curve here, and say we want to figure out what the forward rate would be between 10 years in the future and 20 years of the future are between 2009 and 2019. So how would we calculate that? We would take R20 times 20 years minus R10 times 10 years divided by 20 minus 10, R10 years, and we would get this, 1.07. So we're going to take 0.065 times 20 minus 0.06 times 10 divided by 10, and we get 7%. So since we have an upward sloping yield curve under expectations theory, we are expecting interest rates to go up, and we would have to have a forward agreement during that time period that is slightly higher than the interest rates in condition, in this case, for a 10-year period today, and 7% is higher than the interest rates on here. For the information in this video, I use this nice graph from one of the Brigham and Houston financial management texts, which are available from Cengage. And to get these actual data points, I went to the U.S. yield curve data under long-term trends. I thank you for watching this video.